We are back for another episode of the Erectile Dysfunction Radio Podcast. Today, we are joined by Dr. Thomas Masterson. Dr. Masterson is a urologist and an assistant professor at the University of Miami. He is a specialist in male reproductive and sexual health. One of the areas of his research interest is the treatment of erectile dysfunction. Dr. Masterson and his colleagues recently secured a large grant to research shockwave therapy, the topic of today's episode. Dr. Masterson, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the introduction. My pleasure to be here. So erectile dysfunction can be very distressing. And I think that when men are trying to resolve this issue, they are pretty vulnerable, sometimes desperate, and will try all sorts of interventions in order to get it resolved. Today, we want to understand what shockwave is, whether it works, and where this treatment potentially fits into an array of different approaches to managing and resolving erectile dysfunction. So first and foremost, Dr. Masterson, can you, I guess, kind of describe what this word shockwave even means and and how this is a therapy? Yeah, for sure. So uh, shockwave therapy uh, is something that's been around actually for quite a while. Um, In the field of urology, most are familiar with it in reference to kidney stones, uh, which is, you know, SWAL, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. And what this is, is it's taking very high energy sound waves and directing it in that case on a kidney stone. So you're focusing them into one point. Um, Shockwave therapy, when talking about erectile dysfunction, is, is, is similar but different. It's still shock waves, so it's these high intensity sound waves that are propagating through tissue. But instead of being on a single point, it's being dispersed over a larger area. And usually, talking in this case, the perineum, which is sort of the area between the legs, um, or the penis itself. And the idea behind shock waves is that that energy is being delivered into tissue and causing small um, or micro damage um, on the cells and the vasculature. And that this damage is then igniting the body's natural healing mechanism to try and reverse whatever damage is there. Taking a couple steps back, Shockwave has multiple medical applications outside of urology, if I understand correctly. So could you give us a bit of an overview? I know, I know it might be out of your purview, but if, if um, you could share with us where else people may have encountered Shockwave treatments. Sure. sure there's two main fields where Shockwaves have been used. Um, that are similar to what we're talking about for erectile dysfunction. Uh, and this is in orthopedics and in, in um, uh, cardiology. So in orthopedics, it's used for tendonitis. So say plantar fasciitis being, a, being one, so pain with the tendon of the, the foot. You know, in orthopedics, it's used to try and, and reduce the pain that's associated with, with tendonitis or plantar fasciitis. In cardiology, um, it's been used for myocardial revascularization. So patients who are, have had previous heart attacks, um, trying to, again, uh, use the body's natural healing mechanisms or natural, natural repair systems uh, to try and increase the vascularity to the heart in areas where there's been damage. So shockwave has been used in those fields uh, much longer, and there's, there's good data to show benefits in both, again, orthopedics and plantar fasciitis and in cardiology when trying to revascularize the heart. One of the things that that I think our listeners could benefit from understanding is you mentioned the use of shockwave therapy when it comes to kidney stones. And my Mm. assumption is that means to break up the kidney stone. And you also mentioned with cardiovascular, this concept of regeneration. So it sounds like there's two mechanisms that potentially could apply to erectile dysfunction. One is the regeneration of um, arteries, and the other would be uh, potentially a breaking up of a a plaque buildup within those arteries. So what is the mechanism that shockwave therapy is attempting to uh, facilitate when it comes to improving erections? Yeah. So So the big difference, again, with what's being used in erections versus with kidney stones is if you almost think about it like with a conical mirror, so like that half dome shape where there's a point where everything radiates to, that's what's being used in kidney stones. And if you were to say, put your hand at that one point, it, you know, it would actually be painful. With this, the energy is being dispersed over a larger surface area. So we're not trying to cause that same intensity 
of, of, of damage and putting that intensity of energy in one single spot. Um, what we are hoping that happens is looking at the sort of the endothelium. So that is the lining of the blood vessels that that's where we're hoping some damage occurs. And same thing with the, the smaller, smaller nerves. And that that damage, uh, what it does is then recruits, you know, the body's natural mechanisms of healing. So platelets, uh, the complement system, uh, cytokines and growth factors into the area um, to try and repair. So the hypothesis being that with erectile dysfunction, there is, there's some underlying damage that's already there um, that maybe is not healing, whether it's from diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, high cholesterol, and that by using shockwaves, you're sort of you know, accelerating the process of healing by causing that micro, that, that small uh, dish, that small damage. Um, so it's, it's more, I think, towards the mechanism of what's being used, say, with cardiovascular regenerization, as opposed to what's being used on kidney stones. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Now, uh, before we can even you know, talk about what the potential impacts are, what I have come to learn is that there are multiple shockwave machines mm-hmm. and uh, there are multiple mechanisms uh, by which these machines operate. So can we get a, a down to earth explanation sure. about some of the, the broader categories of these machines that uh, patients may uh, encounter? Yes, yes. So um, first and foremost, we want to define what is an actual shockwave machine. And this has to do with classifications of devices. So when the FDA is looking at, at any, any product on the market, they're going to put them as class one, two, three. Class one is something that basically really isn't causing any damage. Class two is something that, could, that actually has harms. And class three is something that clearly has harms and risks and benefits need to be weighed. True shockwave devices fall under class two. So there are many devices that are marketed as shockwave machines that are not, in fact, shockwave. Um, an example of this is something that's hugely popular, and I don't want to get myself in trouble, but say Gaines Wave. Gaines Wave is not an actual shockwave device. If you can look it up, you will see that there's nothing from the FDA regulating it. True shockwave devices are regulated and do require FDA approval for the creation of shockwaves. Now, none of these devices are actually approved by the FDA for the intent of using for erectile dysfunction. They are, again, approved for for plantar fasciitis, but not for erectile dysfunction. Uh, So there's different ways that the shock waves are generated. Um, You may read about hydroelectro, uh, hydroelectric, piezoelectric, but the, the end result is that they are causing a high intensity sound wave. So if you were to graph it, what you'll see is that there's a large amount of energy being released over for a short distance with then a quick downfall. And that's a true shock wave. Sound waves, which we're familiar with, and you're hearing us, that's sound waves that are being generated. Um, they are at a much longer uh, wavelength and a much, much sh- uh, shorter um, intensity. And that's why you can hear without causing any damage. So when you actually are being treated with shock waves, you can hear the waves being generated and you can feel an impulse. Whereas with the sound waves that are being generated, say through your speakers, you're not necessarily feeling the impulse, but you are still receiving the sound from it. So again, so the, the machines would have to be saying class two, which means that these are a regulated machine because they deliver this, this high yes. intensity um, shock wave that, that's high intensity and then it drops off pretty rapidly as correct. opposed to these longer waves. Is that correct? Correct. So yeah, exactly. So sound waves. So you can't, you can't sit on a speaker uh, and expect to get a therapeutic response. From it. That's a fair way of putting it. Now, between these different machines, I, I would imagine that some of what they'll be looking at in this research project is the efficacy within this class two category of machines between the different mechanisms. Mm-hmm. So is that correct? And is there anything anecdotal that we know already? So yeah, there's actually, Shockwave surprisingly does have some decent data. There are prospective trials uh, looking at efficacy, meaning improvements in erectile dysfunction, both on survey questionnaires and, and Doppler, penile Doppler studies. Where there is some difficulty interpreting the data that's published is there's different machines being used, different protocols that have, meaning the number of shocks being received, the intensity of shocks received, how many days or weeks in a row patients are receiving it. So that's where things get muddled. 
overall, what we've seen is that there does appear to see to be some benefit uh, with minimal harms. And that's the big takeaway is that with Shockwave, there really were not any long-term negative effects from it. Uh, but the benefits tend to be fairly modest. So we're not talking about somebody who's having zero erections after a prostatectomy, uh, you know, now re- recovering and having spontaneous erections. But what we were seeing is patients maybe who were taking Viagra, maybe not requiring it anymore, or if they were taking higher doses, needing less. Um, but this is not something that at least has, has shown itself to be, you know, the cure-all for erectile dysfunction. Okay. And that's, that's important because I, I, I talk a lot on the podcast about how a lot of the management and resolution of erectile dysfunction is multifactorial. And it sounds like what you're sharing is that the, the shockwave uh, treatments when done you know, properly um, with the right machines and the right uh, people administering it can help to make that management easier in a lot of cases or can help reduce uh, the reliance on other interventions. So for men who, who had uh, let's say mild ED, relatively speaking, and we're getting by with low dose uh, medication, may be able to come off of it in some instances. And men who are on <laughs> higher doses can go down, but it's not um, going to be regenerative to the to the extent uh, that somebody who has post prostatectomy would be able to fully yeah. regain spontaneous erections. Absolutely. Now, you know, I'll do my my little soapbox about you know what does it actually take to get an erection? So. Obviously, you need a penis. So without, you know, other than that, there's five things. Blood flow, nerves, hormones, relaxation, and stimulation. Shockwave is going to work on two out of those five. So it's not going to fix relaxation. So if you're in a high state of stress, there's things going on in your life, Shockwave's not going to fix that. Stimulation, if you don't have a regular partner, uh, there's, there's no, you know, you're not receiving any sort of sexual input. Shockwave won't fix that. Same thing with testosterone and your estrogen. It's not going to modify your hormones. What it may help with is patients who have problems with blood flow or the nerves. So that's where this therapy uh, we think has the most amount of promise. Got it. Now, shockwave therapy is highly advertised on the internet, TV, um, the radio. Why, Why is that? Well, the the reality is these devices are not that expensive. The side effects from them or the negative or adverse events that are associated with them are minimal. And the benefits, you know, the upside appears pretty, pretty good. So for men who are, who, you know, unfortunately men sort of rate or, or um, they measure their value uh, on how their penis works. So a lot of clinics know that, men will be willing to pay a decent amount of money for these treatments. And on the clinic side, they know that side effects being minimal, costs for them are minimal. Um, it's a pretty good business idea to get into this, into this. So that's why I think it is so highly advertised. You don't really, because these, these devices are FDA approved for a different use. So this is all off label. Mm-hmm. So as long as it's expe- explained to a patient that it's off label, um, explain to them the risks and patients are willing to pay for it. Uh, patients are willing to go for it. Yeah. So it's a highly motivated patient that wants to resolve this problem. And it's a treatment that is relatively inexpensive to be administered with again, relatively low risk for the patient. And that kind of goes back to, um, what I was mentioning at the beginning, at the intro, which is that it is a vulnerable population, which is why I think it's important to cover these topics to make sure that people have the right information and the right expectations um, when they are um, giving informed consent, but not just signing at the bottom of a stack of papers, that they can actually understand um, what could be expected, what some of the risks are. Now, to that end, so who can administer shockwave therapy for erectile dysfunction? Yeah, great question. So the answer to that is really truly anybody. Uh, You know, we actually tried to look at this for not so much shockwave, but some of the more invasive therapies like stem cell therapy and platelet-rich plasma, which are actually procedures where, you know, blood needs to be drawn, tissue needs to be taken, uh, and you're injecting needles into the penis. 
And what we found is that actually urologists made up the very minority of people administering these therapies. So you had um, family medicine practitioners, you know, people in emergency medicine, obstetrics, orthopedics, uh, basically, you know, anybody who's willing to take on that risk as a provider or as a physician uh, can administer these therapies. You do, um, you do need a medical license, though. When you say anybody. You do. Means, you do. Okay. But yes, I would say anybody with a medical degree. <laughs> okay. uh, and I, I'm going to say it's probably even very state to state. And I don't recall offhand you know, what we looked at. But, you know, it's in some states, uh, you know, people with advanced practice degrees can, meaning like nurse practitioners, uh, PAs can practice independently. And this can be something incorporated into their practice. Um, and I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, you just want to make sure that these things are being done safely, that you're actually receiving the treatment that you believe you're receiving. You know, you can always ask these clinics ahead of time, what device do you have? And a quick Google search can, can find out whether or not it's truly a shockwave device, you know, or this is something, you know, that you can just purchase off of Amazon and do yourself at home. Dr. Mashton, is there an ideal ED candidate for this treatment, in your opinion? Yeah, great question. So yes, I think there is. Um, and the data still is trying to sort this out. But I, I believe this works best for patients with mild to moderate erectile dysfunction. So these are your patients who are taking pills, uh, uh, and not patients, I think, who are have advanced to, the, to needing uh, injection therapy, uh, or have worked their way to the point where they are needing or considering a penile prosthesis. So you know, this is a, probably a good segue. But you know, why are patients so interested in this? Because here, here's what your options are for erectile dysfunction. You're either taking pills like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Avanafil, uh, vacuum erection devices, something that goes on the outside of the penis, pulls blood into it, and you put a constriction band on. Um, or injections where you're actually taking a needle into the side of the penis and injecting a medication in every time you want to have sex. There's a pellet that goes down the urethra. So you actually have to stick it in there. It dissolves, and that causes an erection. Or surgery. To the average guy, none of those options are great. Yes, I was going to say, it sounds like it gets more appealing as this, as this progression goes forward. <laughs> exactly. Everybody wants to go back to when they were 18, and it's like their erections were popping up whether they wanted them or not. They want that spontaneity back. And Shockwave, like all of the restorative therapies, potentially offer that. So that's, that's why they're so appealing. If you, could have a, if you could have a therapy where you don't need to worry about taking a pill 30 minutes beforehand on an empty stomach. You don't have to worry about a drug being refrigerated and then needing to inject yourself. Yeah. So, you know, that's the appeal. So, you know, as we said, I don't think this is going to be the, the ideal therapy for post prostatectomy patients who may have severe nerve damage or severe vascular issue. I don't think this is going to be the, the person who is diabetic, who has this, who has multiple sequelae like retinopathies, kidney problems, bladder problems, because I think these, these patients are just too far along this spectrum of damage. But for, you know, the patients who are otherwise don't have many medical problems, you know, maybe they were diabetic, but now they're well-controlled and they don't really have any other problems. It, these are the patients where these, where shockwave therapy may have the most benefit. Are the results considered long lasting or like many of the other treatments for erectile dysfunction, I really call it management options. Um, is this something that has to be administered on a uh, continual basis in order for it to remain effective? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. There is data showing that, that maintenance therapy, if you will, um, does have benefit. So the idea with this is that maybe upfront you are having sort of more frequent, more intensive therapy. And then after that, coming back in for retreatment, um, there may be some benefit to that, um, but we, we don't have that kind of long-term data available to say with anything, any certainty. And again, it's all going to circle back to, you know, multiple devices used in these studies with different probes being directed to different areas. Um, so there's just right now, it's the issue is standardization to know what patients should be receiving and what's going to provide the most benefit. Okay. And, and let's kind of segue then to the research or the study that's going to be taking place, or maybe already is taking place, um, sure. to, to, I guess, to try to standardize or at least um, um, ascertain some standardizable results um, and ultimately guidance. So patients and providers can be more informed about what is mm -hmm. effective and what is not. 
Yeah. So, you know, we've actually performed, uh, we performed a couple studies here at the University of Miami. Uh, we were using the uh, Dornay More Nova device, and the probe there is directed actually to the shaft of the penis. Um, our most recent trial was comparing treatment protocol protocols. So we randomized patients into two groups. Both received the same number of shots, but in the one group, they were receiving them uh, over the course of a week versus the other, pa- the other group receiving them over the course of two weeks. So same number of shots, just different treatment schedules. And what we saw in that group or in that study was that the results were actually fairly similar. So the number of shocks, whether it was, you know, in that more short intensive period or spaced out over a longer period of time, um, they had very similar results when followed up at three and six months. So what that kind of told us is that maybe it's the number of shocks they received is more important than how they are received. Now, does that mean if we were to say do all the shocks up front one day, is that going to be better than say doing the shocks spaced out over a month? We can't really say that, um, but it does seem to be that there is at least maybe some some uh, uh, variability that's kind of tolerable and and acceptable. Problems are, you know, again, what intensities were we using? What was the settings on the device as far as how many shocks per second, per minute? You know, that's where all of the, again, gets very muddled. Uh, There is some, we did a meta-analysis kind of looking at seven uh, published studies on randomized uh, control or randomized clinical, clinical trials. Again, all of those trials used different protocols, but we tried to see what was the change from baseline to like five, six months follow-up. And again, we saw improvements. So the men who received the actual shocks compared to placebo had greater improvements in, in erectile dysfunction scores on surveys. The, the one being used is something called the IIEF or the International Index of Erectile Function, which is pretty much the, the standard that is used in, uh, in clinical trials. Just to summarize that, uh, it does appear that if you receive treatment almost to it, irrespective of, of how many shots, um, there is some improvement seen at least up to six months. And, and I would imagine that, that uh, the long-term goals of these studies is to try to figure out what protocols for which populations will yield the best results. Knowing, yeah. that, knowing that there, there is some positive results, the question is just what is the mechanism and how do we replicate that in a standardized fashion? Is that correct? Right. Correct. And what's been hard just talking since you brought up mechanism, you know, most of these studies are clinical trials. So mechanism, meaning what's happening at that cellular level, has not really been evaluated in most of these. So it's, you know, it's hard to know. With every any clinical trial, you have patient selection bias you have observer bias, you know, there are things that can influence the results. So we don't have mechanism spelled out quite yet. Uh, so that is something that needs to be evaluated uh, uh, more closely. Now, do you believe that shockwave therapy is here to stay? Or is this a treatment or an approach which will be a temporary bridge until something comes along um, that can do this more effectively? No, I think shockwave is something that's going to be here for a while. Um, Is it going to be here forever? Probably not. I think at some point we'll find something better and, you know, it'll go to the wayside as most medical therapies do. Um, So, but for now, I think shockwave is is going to be around for a while. Um, It is definitely a hot topic in research. Um, And I, and I look forward to seeing, you know, better studies mechanistic studies uh, as we move forward. Now, Dr. Masterson, to, to wrap up, I'm wondering if uh, you could give maybe a couple of pointers for a, a man who's interested in incorporating this type of treatment um, into their management or approach to, to resolving erectile dysfunction, what they should be looking for. I know you mentioned it. I won't ask you to repeat any brand names or whatnot, but, uh, there's a lot out there. And certainly from the patient's point of view, um, a lot of clinics offering what's just being advertised as wave or shock wave therapy. And it's very, very difficult to know 
uh, what's up and what's down. So what are some of those questions that a patient should be asking or should be looking for before they uh, sign on with a clinic to do this? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I would call the clinic ahead of time and see what it is that they're actually doing. Ask them, what device do you have? If they can't answer that, you, it's a red flag. Besides, ask what they're charging. If this is something that is an exorbitant amount of money that is, is outside, of your, outside of your ability to pay, don't go financing these things. You know, the therapies, while they may provide some benefit, they are not going to change your life drastically to the point where, again, you're getting that erection, that spontaneous erection you had as a teenager. Uh, but those are the big ones. Ask, what is it that you have? And then look up, look up the device online. Um, ask how much they're charging and see if it's something that's reasonable. You should not be paying thousands of dollars for these treatments. No way at all. Um, and really just for you, weigh what are the costs and benefits? Uh, so those are the big two. Costs, what device do they have? Aside from the name that you mentioned earlier, are there any specific things to avoid? Yes. So if if you go, if you are asking and they can't answer your questions, avoid those places. Ask them what other treatments they have for erectile dysfunction. So if they're a clinic that's only offering um, shockwave therapy and without anything else, and they're not comfortable prescribing you this, the sort of more on-label things like Viagra, uh, Cialis, if they're not familiar with the other treatments for erectile dysfunction, you know, that is not an informed physician who you want to be handling or dealing with. Um, so make sure that, you know, that they, they seem to talk the talk and walk the walk. Uh, if you go to a place where it's a restorative therapies for all, and they're telling you they're treating erectile dysfunction, plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow, uh, diabetes, all with shockwave, um, I would not go to that place because that is, that they're offering, you know, that's a, that's a situation where they have a hammer and everything looks like a man. Okay. So, so if I, if I could summarize it and just correct me if I'm not getting this, um, the way you intend, but person should see somebody who has a, a full picture of erectile dysfunction, what the treatment options are. And again, shockwave should not be the end all be all. It should be an option that Absolutely. somebody who can really assess the patient uh, in the broader context of the condition and help that patient make an informed decision about which treatment is right for them. That's the type of clinic that a man wants to be at. Should not yes. be at a shockwave clinic that's only for shockwave and should not be at a place that's treating erectile dysfunction with one or maybe two limited treatment options, but not having the whole Absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. You want to go to somebody who truly understands what erectile dysfunction is and you know what they can do to help you. Okay. That's really, really helpful. And I think that's going to be an important take-home message for our listeners. Dr. Masterson, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate you joining us on the podcast and uh, we look forward to getting this episode out to our listeners. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, I really enjoyed talking with you.